Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled God's Mission, My Mission. And this is lesson number five in that series entitled Excuses to Avoid Mission. Hmm, why would we be studying those? <laughs> this is the lesson for November 4 of 2023. And as usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, we have come once again asking your special blessing on us and guidance as we study again these materials that have been prepared for us. May we understand the reasons why people from long ago tried to avoid representing you as best they could uh, and not make those mistakes is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, in our previous lesson, we studied how compliant Abraham was. He may have had some problems, but he was willing to do what God asked him to do and share the experience of God in his life. Not all of us are ready to share God like Abraham did. And if you remember the quotation we read last week, Abraham had a thousand people, many of whom were heads of households that were a part of his entourage, uh, shepherds and some of them were military people to protect uh, them, thieves and so forth. So he was very, and these were people he had, he had convinced to, to join him from, from around different places. Okay, Jim? From the Bible study guide, at some point all people who have had an experience with God will face the temptation to avoid sharing his, this experience with others. It is best to humbly admit to this reality rather than assume such a temptation happens only to others. Once we recognize that we are confronted by this temptation at some point, it is easier to take in t intentional steps out of this zone of avoidance and into the healthier space of sharing God's love with others. Ultimately, excuses to avoid mission are temptations of the devil. Who does not want anyone to hear or experience the goodness of God? From this, from the Bible study guide. In contrast to Abraham, let us look at a couple of examples of biblical stories of people who believed they were God's faithful people, but missed opportunities to which God had called them. We will discuss examples of avoiding God's call in the story of Jonah and the missed possibilities of Jesus' disciples. Jonah did not want to do what God wanted him to do. God asked him to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. Not Syria, it's Assyria, just to make sure we're making this distinction, which was 560 miles from Jerusalem. That would have taken a full month to walk, even for a person in good shape. But Jonah did not want to go, so he went to the coast of Joppa, purchased a ticket to get on a boat and go to Spain, about 2,000 miles to the west, as far away from Nineveh as he could get. Well, let us be honest. The people of Nineveh were very wicked, and they were very cruel. They attacked almost every nation around them, trying to prove that their god of war would help them conquer the, world's, uh, the world. Compare God's call to Jonah with, Abra with God's statement to Abraham about Sodom. See if you can see the comparison. Carrie? Coming from Jonah 1, 2. He, that's God, said, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and speak out against it. I am aware how wicked its people are. That's from okay, America. How, Bible. Notice those words, how wicked its people are, from the American Bible Society. Okay, can you read us the comparison there in Genesis? Genesis 18 verses 20 and 21. Then the Lord said to Abraham, there are terrible accusations against Sodom and Gomorrah, and their sin is very great. I must go down to find out whether or not the accusations which I have heard are true, and that's from the Good News Bible. So it seems like we have a couple of cities that are known for what? Wickedness. Wickedness, yes. Do you think Jonah had a good reason for not wanting to go to Nineveh? Yeah. 
Nahum, who lived about a hundred years after Jonah, had these words to say about Nineveh. Gordon? From uh, Nahum 3, verses 1 onward, doomed is a lying, murderous city, full of wealth to be looted and plundered. Listen, the crack of the whip, the rattle of the wheels, the gallop of horses, the jolt, the jolting of chariots, horsemen charge, swords flash, spears gleam, corpses are piled high, dead bodies without number, men stumble over them. Nineveh, the whore, is being punished, attractive and full of deadly charms. She en enchanted nations and enslaved them from the Good News Bible. Okay. Turns out that uh, this is a little bit of trivia on the side. Turns out that Nineveh had several large libraries of those ancient uh, documents that people have learned, a we have learned a lot about ancient culture from the libraries of Nineveh. Okay. Myra, you want to take on the next couple? I will, if you'll help me with some of these words. Okay. Uh, 2 Kings 17, 5 and 6. Then Shalmaneser, Shalmaneser. Shalmaneser of Assyria invaded Israel and besieged Samaria. In the third year of the siege, which was the ninth year of the reign of Hosea, Hosea the Assyrian emperor captured Samaria took the Israelites to Assyria as prisoners and settled them among, settled them in the city of Hala. Uh, That's okay. fine. Okay. Some near the river harbor in the district of Gozan mm -hmm. and some in the city of Media. Let's talk Nineveh. about that for just a second. The Assyrian uh, assumption was if you conquer a nation, then if you don't want to end up having to fight a rebellion in the future, you take all the people and you scatter them. If you scatter them in many different places, there will not be enough of them in any one place to mount any kind of significant rebellion. That was their theory. Okay, you want me to continue on? Yes, please. Okay, Second Kings 19, 32 and 37. This is about 100 years later. Okay. This in... Uh, verse 32, this is what the Lord has said about the Assyrian Empire, Emperor. He will not enter the city, Jerusalem, or shoot a single arrow against it. No soldiers with shields will come near the city, and no siege mounds will be built around it. He will go back to the, uh, by the same road he came without entering this city. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will defend this city and protect it for the sake of my own honor. I'm not sure what the. No, practice. just skip that. Okay. And because of the promise I made to my servant David. Okay, now go ahead. There's, there's more information. 35. That night, an angel of the Lord went to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 soldiers. At dawn the next day, there they lay, all dead. Then the Assyrian emperor, Shenach, Sennacherib, Arib, withdrew and returned to Nineveh. One day, when he was worshiping in the temple of his god, Nisroch, Nisroch two of his sons, Adramalek, Adramalek and Sherezer, Sherezer, <laughs> killed him with their swords. These are his sons. Uh-huh killed him with their swords, and then escaped to the land of Ararat. Another of his sons, Sir Haddon, succeeded him as emperor. From the good wow. Example. Okay, now the question we'd like to think about, why would God say that defending... Now, remember that the two stories we just read, one happened to the northern kingdom, it was completely overrun by the Assyrians, and the, the, the people in the northern kingdom were scattered. <clears throat> we read those places, some of the places they were scattered to. About 120 years later, so more or less, um, Assyria came back and tried to conquer the southern kingdom of Judah. They conquered pretty much everything except Jerusalem, they couldn't conquer, and they, they surrounded it, and they were going to conquer it. And then, as we just read, God defended it by wiping out the Assyrian army. Mm -hmm. So, 
but God said, why did he say he was going to do that? For the sake of my own honor. For the sake of my own honor. What would that mean? Well, in ancient times, people believed that the gods were the ones responsible for victory in any battle. If a weaker nation lost a battle against a stronger nation, it was because the god of the stronger nation was more, more powerful than the god of the weaker nation. So the true god would be despised if his capital city was conquered and destroyed. Since the Bible and the Jewish people represented that they were regarded as the faithful followers of Yahweh, then Yahweh, uh, Israel's god, would lose face in the eyes of the other nations of the world if Jerusalem was defeated. A very important god of the Assyrians was the god of war. In order to make a name for oneself in Nineveh, he needed to kill many people in a conquest of another nation. So they celebrated the people who had managed to kill a lot of other people. Okay, Ellen White comments, among the cities of the ancient world in the days of divided Israel, one of the greatest was Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian realm. In the time of his temporal prosperity, Nineveh was a center of crime and wickedness. Inspiration has characterized it as the bloody city, full of lies and robbery. In figurative language, the prophet Nahum compared the Ninevites to a cruel, ravenous lion, upon whom, he inquired, hath not thy wickedness passed continually? Nahum 3, 1 and 19, from the book by Ellen White, Prophets and Kings 2.65. Our Bible study guide goes on to say Nineveh was a magnificent city. That's true. Historians tell us that Sennacherib greatly expanded the city, including building the huge southwestern palace that alone measured 1,650 feet by 790 feet, or 503 by 242 meters. That's an enormous building and contained at least 80 rooms. He also built 18 canals to bring water to the city from as far away as 40 kilometers, or 40 miles or 65 kilometers. Its size alone would have been intimidating. But the Assyrians were also ruthless. In his account of the conquest of Babylon, now remember there was a time, uh, some people say that when we, Daniel tells us about Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. But before them, there was Egypt, and after that, probably Assyria before we come to Babylon. And in the days of the Assyrians, when, when the Assyrians were dominant, they actually conquered Babylon before Babylon rose to world dominance. So in his account of the conquest of Babylon, Sennacherib boasted that he filled the streets of Babylon, that is, with the corpses of its inhabitants, young and old relief, relief carvings, found during excavations depict scenes of soldiers impaling their victims. They would just stick a, a sharpened a big, big old board right up through people. Um, these were not people you want to cross. They were not averse to using violence and gratuitously, cruelly, too, against those that they didn't like. Indeed, at the thought of walking among the masses of people in Nineveh, Jonah must have quaked with fear from our Bible study guide. So, with that setting, imagine Jonah's feelings as he thought about approaching Nineveh. Because, and we've jumped over the story of the whale and the stuff, we'll, we'll, get, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Have you ever been convinced that you should, do, you should do something for God's cause that you're afraid to do? Don't we believe that when we are doing God's will, he will protect us? Jim? You want to take on 1 John there? 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. Perfect love dries out all fear. So then, love has not been, excuse me, love has not been made perfect in anyone who is afraid because fear has to do with punishment. Okay, if you're afraid of Nineveh, is that what God's talking about here? What about if you're afraid of God? Well, think about, think about the story of Daniel in the lion's bed. Yeah. Was that a case of not being afraid? Yeah. Keep you awake. Hmm. <laughs> have we thought about, have we thought carefully about our fears? What are we afraid of? Okay, so now we're gonna go to the Jonah story. 
Uh, Kerry? Okay. Uh, Jonah 1 and verses 1 through 12. One day the Lord spoke to Jonah, the son of Amittai. He said, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and speak out against it. I am aware how wicked its people are. Jonah, however, set out in the opposite direction in order to get away from the Lord. He went to Jonah. What are the chances of getting away from the Lord? <laughs> yeah. Well, remember, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, many of the ancient peoples believed that different gods were assigned to different territories. So maybe Jonah had a little bit of that idea that if I go off to uh, Tarshish, uh, God will leave me alone. Okay, go ahead. He went to Joppa where he found a ship about to go to Spain. He paid his fare and went aboard with the crew to sail to Spain where he would be away from the Lord. But the Lord sent a strong wind on the sea and the storm was so violent that the ship was in danger of breaking up. The sailors were terrified and cried out for help, each one to his own God. Then, in order to lessen the danger, they threw the cargo overboard. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone below and was lying in the ship's hold sound asleep. That's incredible. The captain found him there and said to him, What are you doing asleep? Get up and pray to your God for help. Maybe he will feel sorry for us and spare our lives. The sailors said one to another, Let's draw lots and find out Who's to blame for getting us in this danger? They did so, and Jonah's name was drawn. So they said to him, Now then, tell us, who is to blame for this? What are you doing here? What country do you come from, and what is your nationality? I am a Hebrew, Jonah answered. I worship the Lord God of heaven who made land and sea. Jonah went on to tell them that he was running away from the Lord. The sailors were terrified and said to him, that was an awful thing to do. The storm was getting worse all the time, so the sailors asked him, what should we do to you to stop the storm? Jonah answered, throw me into the sea and it will calm down. I know it is my fault that you are caught in this violent storm. That's from the Good News Bible. Do you, think that, do you think that the sailors really believed that one of them was responsible for the storm? I don't know, but they had good sense to let this guy go <laughs> do something. Well, and, and I mean, did they really believe that throwing Jonah into the sea would, would stop the storm? Well, Jonah said it. Yeah, I, I know Jonah said it. It's still a matter of... I mean... I mean, they drew lots to find out who was to blame. Yeah. I mean, we... God's doing all sorts of funny things here in this yeah. story, huh? Why did Jonah think that throwing him into the sea would stop the storm? Okay, Gordon. In the Bible study guide. When the storm came, Jonah blamed himself. His attitude does reveal something about the kind of worldview and understanding of God or gods that many had back then and some today. While various gods they believed ruled in various lands, the sea was deemed the chaotic realm of demons. In the worldview of the mariners, sacrifice was needed to appease their wrath. Although Jonah was a Hebrew, he quite possibly had a worldview that was influenced by the tr traditional beliefs of his time, or at least he understood their thinking. Bible study guide for Monday. Yeah. So Jonah 2, 1 through 3, and 7 through 10, what happened, Myra? From deep inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. In my distress, O Lord, I call to you, and you answered me. From, the deep, from deep in the world of the dead, I cried for help, and you heard me. When I felt my life slipping away, then, O Lord, I prayed to you. Nothing like waiting until... Yeah. <laughs> anyway. And it's in your like the guy who said, I don't want to bother God until I really need him, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, and in, the in your holy temple you heard me. Those who worship worthless idols have abandoned their loyalty to you. 
but I will sing praises to you. I will offer you a sacrifice and do what I have promised. Salvation comes from the Lord. Then the Lord ordered the fish to throw Jonah up on the beach, and it did. Good news. Okay, you think that was a direct response to Jonah's prayer? Well, it sounds like it. The way it's written, it sounds like yeah. that, doesn't it? Yes. I have to tell you a quick, very funny little story. A story told about a, a young girl who went to her mother dropped her off at Sunday school, and she, the story was about Jonah that we're talking about here. And she got a little paper that showed a picture of the fish and Jonah. And so she, after the service was over, she was waiting on the curb, holding her little picture of Jonah and, and the whale, waiting for her mom to come by and pick her up. Along came a man who said, little girl, do you believe that story of Jonah? Oh, yes, I believe that story. And the guy says, what do you think, what do you th think Jonah was praying about when he was in the belly of the whale? And of course, that's what you just read about. And the little girl thought about it for a moment. She says, well, I don't know. I guess I'll have to wait and ask Jonah when I get to heaven. And the man says, well, what if Jonah doesn't go to heaven? And the little girl says, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> <laughs> that's cute, that's cute. <laughs> Many of the ancient peoples believed, this we've already talked about this briefly, that gods were assigned to various territories, and thus Jonah might have had the idea that Yahweh was the God of Israel and that he would not be able to help Jonah outside of Israelite territory. He learned that God is fully active everywhere, even in the bottom of the sea that was supposed to be inhabited with demons. Many Christians, and unfortunately many Seventh-day Adventists in our day, somehow feel that their main focus should be on a getting themselves saved. Doing what? Getting themselves saved. Then there's little time for them to think about reaching out to others. It's very difficult to help someone who is stuck in the mud without getting yourself covered in mud. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, as someone who lived and worked in the muddy streets and roads of Africa for many years, I know what I'm talking about. How can we associate with people of the world without being influenced by their behavior and thinking? It is always easier to pull someone down than it is to raise them up. But we need to remember that who is on our side? God, God is on our side. <clears throat> okay. Another misunderstanding that stops us from accepting God's call into mission is believing that success depends on ourselves. We can no more save a soul than Jonah could save Nineveh. We can have a savior mentality about mission. Our goal is not to do the saving, but to cooperate with God in his saving work. We give testimony praising God for specific ways he is changing us, but only God can draw people to himself. We can plant seeds of truth, but only God can convert the heart. We often confuse our role with God's, which is enough to make anyone find an excuse not to witness. Yes, God used Jonah, but only God, not Jonah, turned Nineveh around. Winning souls is hard, too hard for humans to do on their own. How can we learn? Instead, to let God win souls, but through us and our life and witness from a Bible study guide from Monday, October 30. So what did the, so the sailors that threw Jonah over. What was there? They surely must have recognized that this guy was worshiping some kind of a God that we don't know anything about. Yeah. This is a really powerful God. I mean, yeah. he, he was witnessing at least in that way, even though he's still trying to run away from God. Yeah. Well, what is the best way? Here's a real question for you. What is the best way to find out what God wants us to do? Can we clearly understand God's, understand God's plan for us and for our work? How, how do we communicate with God? How does, probably a better the better question is how does he communicate with us? Well, he communicates with us through Bible study and yeah. we communicate with each other by prayer, through yeah. prayer. And God, we, we communicate back to God through prayer as well. We say that there's uh, guardian angels. We say that the uh, spirit of truth is available. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't think we need to 
confined it to. Okay, so you're all going to tell me how the Spirit has guided you in the last week to go out and witness, right? Well, that's what we're talking about here. Well, how do you know if God is telling you to witness in a certain situation? That's the real question. Yeah. Or is there any situation in which we should not witness? Some of the best talk I've ever done was in airliners coming from Australia over here. Really? Yeah. It's, it's amazing sometimes what comes up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's unusual, I guess, but I've never forgotten that. Yeah. Well, think about that. I'm leaving that to you out there listening. How do you know what God's asking? What, what opportunities God is placing in your way? That's really the question. Another form of excuse that is often prevalent, perhaps unconsciously, is inconvenience. Despite Jonah's incredible experience with the fish, his attitude toward the Ninevites probably had not changed. Do you think just being swallowed by a fish and then being spit, it out, spit on the shore changed Jonah's attitude toward the Ninevites? Not with the stories that we've heard about what the Ninevites did. No. Yeah. Okay. This is a little aside, but in your reading over the years of archaeology and all, I often wonder who cleans up the mess of dead soldiers? Do they yeah. just let the crows get them and they move on, or somebody cover them over, or what? Has there been any records of finding that kind of stuff down under? There have been a lot of mass graves in places where probably people a lot of people got killed in war and they just sort of shoved them into a big mass grave. Yeah. Yeah. It would have to be something like that. I mean, and, and of course, people have argued and argued and argued about this 185,000 Assyrians being killed around Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, theoretically, their bones ought to still be out there somewhere. Yeah, I mean, and what would, I mean, if there are really 185,000 people dead, and it's, it's possible that we have misunder, misinterpreted the number there, that we've already, we've talked about sometimes in the past, that some of these ancient Hebrew numbers, it's hard to know for sure, you know. It's uh, only the pendulum swing. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, but anyway, the, even, even if it's a few hundred or a thousand people dead out there, what did the people, of Jerusalem, when they realized that the military was gone away, come out there and spend the next month or so burying people? I've often wondered. Yeah. It's just, these days you'd have a bulldozer or something, but not back then. Yeah. Another form of excuse that is often prevalent, perhaps is unconsciously, is inconvenience. We've looked at that a little bit. Despite Jonah's incredible experience with the fish, his attitude toward the Ninevites probably had not changed, as we already suggested. Jonah 3, 1 through 10, I think that's yours, Gordon. Once again, the Lord spoke to Jonah. He said, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to the people the message I have given you. So Jonah obeyed. So this time he obeyed. Yes. Maybe it should say. So Jonah obeyed the Lord and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to walk through it. Jonah started through the city, and after walking a whole day, he proclaimed, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Now, does that sound like a wonderful um, Christian uh, uplifting. conversion, uplifting message? No, but really. the people of Nineveh maybe needed to hear it in plain. Yeah, I, I think it got their attention. Yeah. It was honest. Yes. So verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God's message, so they decided that everyone should fast, and all the people from greatest to the least put on sackcloth to show that, he had re that they had repented. When the king of Nineveh heard this, he got up from his throne, took off his robe, put on sackcloth, and sat down in ashes. He sent out a proclamation to the people of Nineveh. This is an order from the king and his officials. <coughs> no one is to eat anything. All persons, cattle and sheep, are forbidden to eat or drink. Wow. How do you forbid the cattle from eating or drinking? How do you keep them from? No. Yeah. Well, well, I guess you keep them... Uh, here's, here's a question I want you to up. think about. Suppose that God directed you to go to, let's say, Beijing, 
and you start marching through the streets of Beijing saying, Beijing is about to be destroyed. What do you think would happen to you? But you have to go back and put Jonah in the whale <laughs> and on the ship and the soldiers obviously witnessed. That's all fine, but in China there would be hundreds, thousands of Chinese soldiers with bayonets drawn if you go by what they do these days. Yeah. So, I mean, why did these people, these, these wicked, violent people, why did they, I mean, this is a foreigner. This guy's come from a place far away. Why did they believe his message? Was it possible that the ocean and these beings or demons that were in the ocean were so powerful <laughs> in their thinking that, I, I don't know. Well, Nineveh is a long way from the ocean, so I don't know whether they were big into that kind of thinking, but could, maybe. Verse, Go ahead. We continue with verse 6. When the king of Nineveh heard about it, he got up from his throne, took off his robe, put on sackcloth, and sat down in ashes. He sent out a proclamation to the people. This is an order from the king and his officials. No one is to eat anything. All persons, cattle, and sheep are forbidden to eat or drink. I guess we read that. All, person, all persons and animals must wear sackcloth. Everyone... <laughs> the animals have to wear sackcloth? Yeah. That's know, what it says. I suspect it's generalizing, but everyone must pray earnestly to God and must give up his wicked behavior and his evil actions. Perhaps God will change his mind. Perhaps he, he will stop being angry and will not, and we will not die. Wow. God saw what they did. He saw that they had given up their wicked behavior. So he changed his mind and did not punish them as he had said he would. Good news Bible. Uh-oh. Yeah, so he changed his mind. He, does God do that? No. Well, once again, the Lord spoke to Jonah. I'm sorry, spoke to Jonah. Had Jonah said anything further to the Ninevites about what God expected of them? I mean, surely he said something more than 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. What do they know about God's expectations? I mean, they weren't exactly biblical scholars. Did Jonah tell them anything about the, his experience with the fish? Did anything about his appearance support his story? I mean, did his skin, was it all, you know, changed in color or somehow or other from having been down in the belly of a fish? Acid washed. Maybe. Okay, now the challenge is Jonah 3.10, a contradiction of Malachi 3.6. And what does Malachi 3.6 say? I am the Lord, and I do not change. And what did Gordon read a little while ago on verse 10 right above there? He changed his mind. And that's not Jonah, but God. Yes. Yeah. Changed his mind. So we have a contradiction here. That's the way the text is written anyway, or translated. Yeah. yeah. Well. We have enough ex examples of of the translation be, being based upon the people's well, point of view. All the, all the scholars that we know about, um, the people who've done the translation, they basically say that's what the Hebrew says. That's apparently what Jonah wrote. Uh, that's the question we have to try to figure out. Like it's been said before, and in fact, in fact you said it here, the ancients thought whatever was happening is God's doing yeah. mm -hmm. or God's will or whatever. Yeah. So the only information we have about Jonah and his message to the Ninevites is that short expression, quote, in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. So let me just give you your, your two bits of, 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 of opinion. Surely Jonah must have said something more than that. I mean, he must have, I mean, did he, he, he must have said something about his God, or, or, I mean, what did he say? Well, but rather persuasive, though, wouldn't he? It sounds like it. <laughs> Considering what we know about the Ninevites, wouldn't you expect them to turn on Jonah and destroy him? Wouldn't that be the obvious ex thing you would expect? Obviously, Jonah's God was... Doing something. <laughs> something you don't mess with. <laughs> do, you see, do you expect to see some of those Ninevites in heaven? 
I put together everything you know about God and his ways and his judgment. I hope so. See, we don't know what, what the destruction, what was going to cause it, or what was we don't the positive know. agent. No. It just says it was going to be destroyed. So it yeah. it's, uh, wasn't like, the, hey, the, the flood's coming in 120 years, or uh, uh, I, I, Sodom didn't have a whole lot of warning, just uh, <laughs> they didn't, barely had no warning. No. And so... Uh, well, what did the Ninevites know about God's will? That's a fair question, isn't it? Then Jonah went out on a hill east of Nineveh to watch and see Nineveh destroyed. Now, let's think about this a little bit. Jonah had just done, how did he get to Nineveh? Well, he was almost there. He was delivered, he was delivered by a fish. as close as it, he could by a fish, yeah. which no, isn't that, very close. It wasn't close at all. And he probably almost certainly had to go home first and from having been vomited out of the, the, the fish's mouth. And so let's just assume that he's at home. And what is he, what is he going to do? What is he going to say? What does he tell? Did he, did he have a wife and children? What did he say to them? Uh, excuse me, wife, I've got a little business to take care of. Did he? Well, let's go on. Let's read. I mean... Did, don't you suppose he told some people why he, where he was going and what he was planning to do? Wouldn't that be logical? Yeah. Well, now he's going to go out and he's going to listen. He's going to watch so he can tell the story as it really happened when he gets back home, right? Yeah. What happened? God changed his mind. God was able to work through Jonah despite his attitude about people from other nations. Okay, having to face our prejudices, this is a Bible study guide, having to face our prejudices requires humility. Mission also requires time and emotional energy. Investing in others' lives and truly caring for them can be taxing in an age when we are stressed keep, keeping up with our own lives and pro problems. Providing emotional support can seem just too exhausting. And finally, being involved in, mi in mission often requires that we change how we feel about and use our money. Oh dear. Whether related to providing care for people, purchasing literature and outreach materials, or paying for services or conveniences to free up time for mission work, there are expenses related to mission. Whatever form it may take, mission work requires sacrifice. The good news is that in spite of Jonah's inadequacies, God worked powerfully in bringing the Ninevites to repentance. Sadly, Jonah did not share in the blessing of heaven's joy. From our Bible study guide for Tuesday. You think Jonah was the very best person that God could had available to, to send at that point in time? Nobody else could have done a better job? No. Maybe he's the one, maybe Jonah's the one that would teach the lesson. Yeah, which could be drawn from elsewhere. Another reason why people hesitate to reach out to others is because it might lead to uncomfortable confrontations. Even with God, Jonah complained about God's kindness and mercy. Jim? Jonah, chapter 4, verses, verse 2. So he prayed, Lord, didn't I say before I left home that this is just what you would do? That's why I did my best to run away into Spain. I knew that you are a loving and merciful God, always patient, always kind, and always ready to change your mind and not punish. Uh -oh. You know, he had, he had a pretty good picture. Yeah. He just was, uh, it, it, actually, he knew more about the character of God. Huh. Maybe, maybe he knew something about the uh, uh, book of Job. Well, maybe. He says it right there. He says, and, and not punish. Yeah. He says, I'm already. It, yeah. It, but he also has something else to say. You're always ready to change your mind? Is that the truth about God? 
Yeah, well, there again, I'd like to look at that a little bit more carefully. And that could very well be what it says, but, uh, you know, he, he obviously wasn't, uh, uh, he wasn't the status of how Jesus was when they were ready to, uh, to kill him. Yeah. So. Obviously, Jonah and God had previously had other conversations. So what was Jonah's response to God's love? Gary? Jonah 4, verses 3 through 10. Now, Lord, let me die. I am better off dead than alive. I'm going to ask a question. Was he just upset, so upset that he wanted to die, or was he worried about his reputation when he got home? The latter. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, go ahead. He was self-centered, wasn't he? Very much. The Lord answered, What right have you to be angry? Jonah went out east of the city and sat down. He made a shelter for himself and sat in its shade, waiting to see what happened, what would rather happen to Nineveh. Then the Lord God made a plan grow up over Jonah to give him some shade so that he would be more comfortable. Jonah was extremely pleased with the plant, but at dawn the next day at God's command, a worm attacked the plant and it died. After the sun had risen, God sent a hot east wind and Jonah was about to faint from the heat of the sun beating down on his head. So he wished he were dead. I am better off dead than alive, he said. And in brackets, was Jonah depressed? Jonah was depressed. But, but God said to him, what right have you to be angry about the plant? Jonah replied, I have every right to be angry and angry enough to die. Boy, he's right up there, isn't he? The Lord, he's arguing with God. Yeah, the Lord said to him, this plant grew up in one night and disappeared the next. You didn't do anything for it and you didn't make it grow, yet you feel sorry for it. How much more then should I have pity on Nineveh? that great city. After all, it has more than 120,000 innocent children in it, as well as many animals. And that's from the Good News Bible. Okay. <clears throat> Gordon? From the Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, Jonah was grateful not for God, who performed the miracle, but for the plant. Rather than seeing this as an unmerited miracle, he saw it as an appropriate and well-deserved blessing that followed his good works. Wow. <laughs> when the plant died, it was a misfortune that caused Jonah to grow angry and insecure in his self-worth, and his thoughts grew suicidal. Wow. Huh. Bible study guide for Wednesday. Are we worried that despite our efforts, someone might not respond and might even reject us? Jonah is the only book in the Bible that ends with a question mark. Why do you think that is? Don't everybody talk at the same time. Oh, no. Well, through Jonah, God is throwing the challenge to us. Yes. We've already looked at several questions we have hesitant answers to, and this is a book that raises a lot of questions. The story of Nineveh certainly reveals that God loves all of his children, even those who are rebellious and misbehaving. Jonah was a known prophet of God. And here's the one bit of information we have about his background. 2 Kings 14, 25. Myra? He conquered the, all the territory that belonged to Israel. Now this is talking about the king of Israel. Go ahead. This is talking about the king of Israel? Yeah. Okay. Uh, he conquered all the territory that had belonged to Israel from Hamath, pass in the north to the Dead Sea in the south. This was what the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised through his servant, the prophet Jonah, son of Amit, Amitai, Amitai. Amitai, from gath Hefer. Okay, so here's, here's a prophet who was known to the king. He had prophesied what, was going, what the king was going to do, and now he's later in his life sitting outside of Nineveh in the heat, complaining about God. Now what's going to happen when he goes back home? 
Seems like he doesn't have a lot of character. Don't you think God is still calling for mission volunteers? As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that it is our duty to present the three angels' messages, the final warning message to the world, to everyone around us. Are we doing that? Or are we to wait until we get a specific call from God before we do something? How are we supposed to know when God has called us to do anything? Okay, Jim, I guess you're... Okay. No. Yeah. Is that me? Okay. A friend of the Bible said a guy at challenge, on a blank sheet of paper or in your prayer journal, make a list of 10 people you know are not believers. We will call them your disciples. Let them by, excuse me, list them by name if possible. Keep the list close by and for the rest of the quarter, pray daily for each of your 10 disciples. Pray that God will help you become casual friends with those who are acquaintances. Pray that you can develop be deeper, closer trust in relationships with your casual friends. As you deepen your relationships, carefully watch and listen to so you can identify their specific needs, hurts, and pain. Then pray that God will meet them in that area of need. Challenge up. Choose a city near you as well as a city in another part of the world. Begin praying for the people who live and work in each. Ask that God will raise up a strong Adventist presence that can share the truth as we know it the truth about the soon coming of Jesus from the Bible study okay. guide. What happens if you choose a place like Shanghai or even Beijing? I will tell you that in my visit to Beijing a number of years ago, my wife was asked to go into China and teach some classes there. We, uh, I won't go into all the details, almost miraculously, we were escorted to the Adventist church on Sabbath morning. The place was jammed. Mm -hmm. And you you didn't have a choice about where to sit. They escort you to where, because they didn't want any spaces left. They packed you in. The and, it was, and they found someone who could speak English to try to translate for us. Um, but it's very interesting. In the city, it was of course, not a huge you know, place. It's sort of hidden back behind some other buildings. But Shouldn't we be praying for places like that if the gospel is supposed to go to the whole world? And what difference does it make if you pray for Beijing? Well, it helps some people somewhere, I think. In town. Yeah. We're talking about praying for Beijing, though. Yeah. Okay, Ellen White had some comments. Maybe we should pay, pray for Moscow. Yeah, to do that, too. Ellen White says, the excuses of those who fail to do this work do not relieve them of the responsibility. And if they choose not to do this work, they neglect the souls for whom Christ died, neglect their God-given responsibility, and are registered in the books of heaven as unfaithful servants. Wow. Does the minister work as did the master to be a strength and a blessing to others when he shuts himself away from those who need his help? Uh, now she's going to take on the ministers. Those who neglect personal intercourse with the people become self-centered and need this very experience of placing themselves in communication with their brethren that they may understand their spiritual condition and know how to feed the flock of God, given to each his portion, giving to each his portion of meat in due season. Those who neglect this work make it manifest that they need more renovation and then they will see they have not carried the burden of the work. From the Adventist Review, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, I'm sorry, August 30, 1892. So that was a letter sent back from Australia to the United States in 1892. What kind of response do you think she got? Probably zip. Yeah. Okay, notice the specific words for Bell and White about Jonah. In the charge given him, Jonah had been entrusted with a heavy responsibility, yet he who had bidden himself go was able to sustain his servant and grant him success. Had the prophet obeyed unquestionably, he would have been spared with many 
bitter experiences and would have been blessed abundantly. Yet in the hour of Jonah's despair, the Lord did not desert him. Through a series of trials and strange providences. <laughs> strange providences? I'm going to yes. the story of Jonah. The is strange. confidence in God and in his infinite power to say was to be revived. This is Mrs. White, Prophets and Kings 266, paragraph 3. Okay, contrast the story of Jonah with the story of Isaiah. Gordon? Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzzah died, Isaiah, Isaiah died, not not the prophet Isaiah, but King Isaiah died. Yeah. I saw the Lord. He was sitting on his throne, high and exalted, and his robe filled the whole temple. Round him, flaming creatures were standing, each of which had six wings. Each creature covered his its face with two wings, and its body with two, and used the other two for flying. They were calling out to each other, Holy, 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 the Lord Almighty is holy. His glory fills the world. The sound of their voices made the foundation of the temple shake, and the temple itself was filled with smoke. I said, There is no hope for me. I am doomed because every word that passes my lips is sinful, and I live among a people whose, whose every word is sinful. And yet, with my own eyes, I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the creatures flew down to me, carrying a burning coal that he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with the burning coal and said, This has touched your lips, and now your guilt is gone, and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will be our messenger? I answered, I will go, send me. Okay, was that, uh, was he a missionary volunteer or was he felt like he was a little uh, compelled? After you, after you just had your lips touched with the burning coal? <laughs> yeah. So that wasn't literal, but. Well, turning to the New Testament, think of the story of Jesus' disciples after that lengthy discussion found in John chapter 13 to 16, that's the story of the upper room, as they approached the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay. Matthew 26, 36 to 45. When Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Grief and anguish came over him. And he said to them, The sorrow in my heart is so great that it almost crushes me. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further on, threw himself face down, downwards on the ground, and prayed, My father, if it is possible, take this cup of suffering from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he returned to the three disciples and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, How is it that the three of you are not able to keep watch with me even for one hour? Keep watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more Jesus went away and prayed, Jesus, My father, if this cup is of suffering cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. He returned once more and found the disciples asleep. They could not keep their eyes open. Again, Jesus left and went away, and he prayed a third time, saying the same words. Then he returned to the disciples and said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be handed over to the power of sinners. Get up, let us go. Look. Here is the man who is betraying me. Wow. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. Why do you think the disciples were so prone to falling asleep despite Jesus' request to them? Is it possible that Satan was doing his best to keep them asleep? Have you considered that possibility? Surely the disciples loved Jesus and they had many reasons for doing that. As we know, the next thing that happened was the arrest of Jesus. See Matthew 26, 47 to 56. We don't have time to read that. 
We may feel like we understand the gospel and we love Jesus, but are we tempted at times to fall into spiritual sleepiness? Returning to Jonah's story in conclusion, he missed two wonderful opportunities to witness for God. The first one was when the sailors asked him to pray to his God. And what did he do? He asked them to throw him overboard to what he believed would be his death. What kind of a witness to God was that? Well, how did Jonah know that throwing him overboard would end the storm? What did the sailors think about after the storm calmed? They must have just been completely flabbergasted. They threw him over, whoosh, and the storm stops like that. Wow. The second incredible missed opportunity was after the people of Nineveh repented. Jonah should have returned to the city and spent time uh, talking to them about God's will and what they, what they could do to serve him. But Jonah uh, became angry and even angry at God and complained about God's kindness and mercy, as we read earlier. So he, Jonah prayed, Lord, didn't I say before I left home that this is just what you would do? That's why I did not my best to run away to Spain. I knew that you are loving uh, and merciful God, always patient, always kind, always ready to change your mind and not punish. Jonah's excuses are wrapped up in what today we call ethnocentrism, prejudice, and racism. Our world is full of these problems. All too often, even among Seventh-day Adventist churches, Christians, we might hear ideas that would reflect these prejudices. They are not a good excuse for us for our failure to witness. As individuals and as churches, we need to take an honest look at our daily lives and hold ourselves accountable. If we are not actively pursuing relationships with people who are suffering or need help and bearing their burdens, we have grown complacent. Accountability requires getting together with a small group of trusted friends from your local church who are willing to be open about their complacency and are ready to help help each other come up with ways to rekindle experiences with God by creatively sharing Him with the broader world around us. For others, the reality is grimmer. They have developed excuses to avoid mission to a specific groups of people such as Muslims or Catholics because they feel that these people are unworthy of God's love. If we are afraid of certain groups or think they are not worth saving, then it is a sign something was wrong with us, not with the group in question. Honest assessment takes an, a level of self-scrutiny and truthfulness that is hard to achieve. But a church willing to grapple with these realities is a church the Holy Spirit can influence from our Bible study guide. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the blessings we enjoy. We thank you for these stories which challenge us to think about all that you have done in the past and why certain things were allowed and reported. Now give us guidance that we may represent you more more correctly and better in our day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.